Well, good evening, everyone. It's 7.25, and uh, I have five minutes uh, for my introduction. Uh, welcome to Tom Padula TV and Insania Booksellers. Uh, I am Tom Padula, and I'm bringing you... This is the ninth uh, presentation, or lesson, if you like, about uh, history, world history. And uh, in this time so far, uh, you know, my mind and my enthusiasm for it has already increased quite considerably. And I was aware that last week I said uh, I would bring you some more pictures, etc., uh, relating to Egypt. Now, well, tonight I'm going to do uh, finish off uh, the chapter on Egypt, and um, then in the near future I, I thought, yeah, it's time for a bit of revision and uh, sometimes to have a, a bit of a break uh, between... Uh, certain sections of uh, of the historical uh, development. T tonight, uh, this evening, I'm going to uh, go back to Egypt, of course, with finishing off um, what I have to say about Egypt initially. And um, then um, I said I would do some Indigenous history, Aboriginal history, the history of Australia and a bit of literature, just a bit. And then I've got um, quite a few Italian song lyrics uh, because uh, uh, even they are sort of learning about the difference between a song that's sung uh, without music and with music. And also the use of the song for educational purposes, for linguistic purposes. So there you are, it's, it's sort of uh, all coming together and uh, I'll use the, some of the same material in order to consolidate uh, what I'm doing. The advantage of all this is that um, uh, once uh, uh, these lessons, uh, presentations are set, we'll go be able to go back to them and refer to them uh, by going to my Facebook page or eventually in the insegna.com uh, website uh, under blog. Uh, they'll be important because they'll be in order and uh, it'll be away from what else I, I, I sort of I enjoy myself with, with Facebook, uh, with personal, whatever, my, my very many interests, you know, as the day develops, we live day by day, so I appreciate uh, each day as much as I can and, uh, yep, and th that's about it uh, for tonight and I hope you'll enjoy the singing part. <laughs> I'm really loving it, honestly. It's 7.28. Uh, what else can I say about history? In terms of history, there are many types of histories. And I sort of, just before, just a few minutes ago, I thought to myself, you know, what can we do for history? We can have a history timeline, what we remember, uh, talking, talking history, Aboriginal or Indigenous, you know, people of Australia, history, history of Italian singing, our personal history, activities from what we've learned in the, this history, uh, in the World History series. Uh, you can also have activities from, from this. You can travel and go to museums. Uh, you can, history of the, of the world. In other words, don't just stick to the one nation. Uh, you know, there are continents, so the history of each continent, Europe, North America, Asia, Africa. I haven't mentioned Africa very often. I'm becoming conscious of it now. Uh, history of every nation, local history, economic history, health history, the history of the various, uh, you know, industrial history, agricultural history, singing about, singing about history, the music of the world, etc., etc., etc. And... Uh, uh, I also looked at the timelines and I said, okay, so we had the Stone Age, we had the Copper Age, the Bronze Age, Iron Age and the Steel Age. So in other words, the Copper and Bronze Age, that's uh, where Egypt comes in. They were the main uh, civilization of the times, the most powerful ones in terms of the Copper Age. But when the, the Steel Age, uh, the Iron Age arrived, uh, they were overcome by by the Hittites, you know. Uh, so, and we'll come to that in the next few presentations, lessons. So, it's 7.30 and I'm going to start. 
uh, you know, it'd be nice to, to have a few people coming on, but I'm aware of uh, the fact that the, the work that I do now will remain and uh, people will be able to access it whenever they can. So welcome to anyone who comes on to the program tonight. Uh, we're going to start with the invention of the glass uh, in ancient Egypt, okay? So later, early in the, in the Bronze Age, early in the Bronze Age, Egyptians discovered how to make glass vases and bottles from sand. That's where the glass came from. Glass continued to be scarce and precious for a very long time. So even, for example, 500 years ago, a glass wasn't, uh, you know, in Europe, uh, it, it wasn't that common. Uh, but, uh, but it was there uh, since the Egyptian time. So, uh, you know, it's a very specialised area. Uh, and uh, I was lucky enough to go to Venice and look at the way they, uh, they, they sort of used glass uh, to make all sorts of um, f figurines and... Uh, whatever, vases, etc. Now, other craftsmen working with gold and precious stones produced exquisite jewellery that compares favourably with the best work of today. So the best work of today, uh, nice to, have to see Enza coming on, uh, uh, the best work of today in terms of the use of gold, silver, compares very well with Egyptian uh, craftsmen of the times. We're talking about, you know, 5,000 years ago. Now, the other, another big area of discovery, if you like, is the fine linen and tapestry. You remember that some Neolithic people learned to weave rough linen cloth from flax fibres. Well, the best Egyptian linen can barely be distinguished from silk. And the weavers became skillful enough to make the first tapestries in the world. So the Egyptians made tapestries uh, from uh, fine, you know, fine linen. Very good. With their copper, later bronze, tools, carpenters and cabinet makers produced rich furniture inlaid with ivories and ebony, plated with gold leaf and upholstered with soft leather cushions. So they, you know, we saw last last week from those pictures they saw, and I will bring you more of those, but not today, not today. In a Boston museum, you may still see the ancient sedan chair in which slaves used to carry the queen, who was the mother of the pharaoh Khufu, the builder of the Great Pyramid. So around the world, of course, you know, artifacts from Egypt. Uh, are valuable artefacts that are seen in museums around the world, especially in the United States, even in Australia. Again, you know, uh, this, these things are all over the world. And so uh, there's been, you know, through wars, etc., some of the very valuable ancient pieces have gone into uh, modern city uh, museums. The, the other big one is um, seafaring. So... If we look at the Neolithic age, at the Neolithic age, and uh, we think, well, did they move, did they go on water? How did they do it? Did they do it on a trunk? Did they uh, build a canoe? What, what did they do? So, and this is where oh, we will come in, we will come in and uh, say, say, look at North America uh, with the Indians and the indigenous people there that built canoes. Now, canoes are also available here in Australia and in Europe, etc. But the Egyptians, even four, five thousand years ago, were able to build uh, a ship with a, a sail to go up and down the Nile. Very good. So, here we go. Neolithic and perhaps late Paleolithic men had built crude bark or dugout canoes and later uh, coracles. No, I don't know what a coracle is, but I'm assuming it's... Um, it's a type of boat. Uh, but in the Copper Age, Egyptian carpenters constructed the first sea-going ships. They had one large sail which could be used when running before the wind, but they could not tack against the wind as late as sailing ships could. So uh, for much of their voyages, they were propelled by slaves toiling at the oars. 
And if you looked at the Ten Commandments, uh, some of the old um, Hollywood films, you know, where the where the slaves are, uh, you know, are moving the ship along. In the Bronze Age, ships of more than a hundred feet long were quite common, and in them the Egyptian traders made voyages not only up and down the Nile, but also across the Mediterranean and along the length of the Red Sea. The Red Sea is next to Egypt, uh, towards Saudi Arabia, and North, you know, Africa, Eritrea, Ethiopia, etc. Now, trade to Syria and Crete. Now we're talking about. 2,000 years before the birth of Christ. The early established, the Egyptians early established a colony at Byblos, Byblos, uh, on the coast of Syria, whence they brought cargoes of the famous cedar wood of the Lebanon. Uh, Welcome Nina Alberti and welcome Pasquale Robilotta. Appreciate the fact that uh, uh, you, you came on tonight. Egyptian sailors also across the open sea to the large island of Crete and to the smaller islands of the Aegean Sea near Greece. So the Egyptian, the, the Egypt Empire, if you like, uh, moved north, east, uh, west as well, but it doesn't, nothing is mentioned here about going to the other side, you know, towards Libya and Tunisia, etc. But I'm sure that they could have done that as well, you know, uh, the, you know, when there's a state and it has a powerful army, uh, they, you've got to put them to work. So they go to different places. To all these places, they took not only their pottery, glass and other merchandise, but also some of their knowledge. Crete, for instance, was a civilised country by 2000 before Christ, by 2000 BC. So we're already seeing now, you know, the writing, etc., coming on. Uh, being used very much. Now, the land of Pant, the land of Pant is like Abyssinia and Ethiopia, Eritrea. Other ships made dangerous voyages of, to the land of Pant, as the Egyptians called Abyssinia, returning with cargoes of ivory from the elephants, gold dust, cinnamon, cinnamon wood, ebony, myrrh, monkeys and slaves. That's what they used, the big trade in slaves. Human against human. There you are. In addition, they brought back, as sailors do, amazing tales of the marvels they had seen and the dangers they had escaped. One papyrus book of about 2000 before Christ is based on a voyage to the land of Punt. The improbable adventures of the hero give, gives us the first version of the, of the story of Sinbad the the sailor, and you know, the Sinbad the sailor books are available in all languages. Uh, welcome to Angela and to Maria uh, Anna Cassino as well. Yeah, it's great to see a few people coming on. Now, I'm going to mention the names because uh, I see that no one actually puts any comments or whatever. Please do. I mean, you can ask questions, you can make a comment, so that's why you come on and. It's good. I feel uh, as if I'm not on my own uh, when I do this. But of course, there are a lot of people who come on afterwards, and I can see it, uh, that listen to the uh, to these um, presentations. Now, these are, will, are available all the time. You can go back uh, to the first presentation, and, and this is number nine. Uh, so that's where we are now. Now, today, the actual achievements of the Egyptians seem to us more amazing than the fairy tales of this old book. When the Frenchman Ferdinand de Lesseps built the Suez Canal in 1869, so the Suez Canal opened up a trade between Europe through the Mediterranean uh, to the Far East, and including Australia. People thought it a great triumph of modern scientific engineering, but the first Suez Canal was built 4,000 years ago by the Egyptians. A small one, <laughs> not as big as the other one. Nevertheless, we now know that the Egyptians dug a canal connecting the eastern, easternmost arm of the Nile Delta with the Red Sea nearly 4,000 years ago so that the largest ships of those days could sail freely back and forth from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean. Let me have a drink. It's 
So that's uh, you can you can see the way civilization works. You know, you, it's like a lever. Uh, one little discovery leads to the next, to the next, to the next. Fantastic stuff. Now, this Sinai copper mines, Mount Sinai. The busiest sea lane of all was perhaps that across the northwestern arm of the Red Sea. Here, ships plied constantly, carrying copper ore from the ferrous mines on the Sinai Peninsula to ports on the Egyptian coast or through the canal to the Nile. We learned in the last chapter how essential a good supply of metal is for civilised life. You know, making of chariots, uh, arms, tools, implements, all that. You may still see the copper mines on the Sinai Peninsula today, and yet the great power and influence of Egypt, Egypt came to an end about the middle of the 12th century before Christ. It was an abrupt bang. And why was that? This was partly because the Iron Age was beginning, but not as the Copper Age had done in Egypt. So the Iron Age, they say, it was about 12th, you know, the 13th century before Christ. The Iron Age ends Egyptian power. And that had a drastic effect on... Uh, Egyptian civilization as well, and the, the great progress of the great architects and builders of Egypt. It sort of, they too disappeared, literally. And uh, a lot of the works, the written works, also disappeared. So the civilization, some remained, but a lot of it went, never to be seen again. Pity. About 1300 BC, large quantities of iron were discovered in Asia Minor by the warlike people who then lived there, the Hittites. Now, the Hittites are the Turks, Turkmen, near Syria, actually watching uh, uh, a series called, uh, called uh, Resurrection of Earth Rule. Incredible. That's about the Hittites. That's where the Hittites were. Uh, and they caused the end of the Iron Age. And, um, you know, there was a city called Aleppo, Aleppo, 5,000 years, years old, like Matera, where I come from in southern Italy, Provincia, well, Provincia Matera in Basilicata. That city too is about 5,000 years old. Amazing. And I've also visited in, um, uh, in Sicily as well. Uh, you know, Stone Age people lived in caves. Well, it could be Neolithic too because there were so many caves. Anyway, armed with new and deadly iron weapons, Asiatic peoples conquered the Egyptians who still used bronze, partly out of tradition, but mainly because they had no iron ore readily available in their country. So having having uh, primary mineral resources uh, means also that you your civilization can progress you know with buildings uh, all sorts of things egypt was the last great power of the bronze age in the next chapter we shall learn about the other cradle of civilization southwest asia from which this conquest of egypt came so they were the sumerians the babylonians uh, near the Euphrates Tigris uh, rivers in Syria. But let's not forget that this is only one area of the world. One area of the world. You've got to keep in mind that we've got India, the Indus River. You've got China, the Yellow River. And progress was made in those areas there. We've got to remember that in Europe, things started to move too with cro Magnon men in uh, France. And also the northern, near the North Pole, the Vikings area. Now that's going to be another area of discovery for us. And then we've got to go to Africa. What, you know, we talked about, uh, about the Red Sea, but the Red Sea and the Nile go right down to Africa, to the desert areas. Now, where's this history of all that? They are Neolithic people, 
Paleolithic and Neolithic. Paleolithic is the old Stone Age time, and Neolithic is when they've got when they when they have villages. So when you have villages, you have one leader. It's like you know, uh, one leader, say fifty, hundred people, whatever they nominate. So he controls and directs and protects and provides for his group, for his tribe, and they owe him loyalty. Uh, and of course, when they become weak, etc., they get challenged, and there's war, inter, inter sign war within the groups, uh, because someone else, you know, if they're not doing their job properly, then they want to change. So things, uh, politics has always been there in uh, with humans. And I suspect, even when you look at those animal um, animal programs, you know we. You get groups of animals and this sort of, you know, like the lion, the male lion, and the new lion comes up, you know, things like that. So it's it's part and parcel of uh, of the way we behave. Well, let's not forget, we didn't come from the monkeys. The monkeys also came from, uh, you know, the serpents and the fish and the shells and, and the little cell a million years ago. Or even longer, so we come from there. But when we read, and I'm going to bring religion here because religion, the pharaohs, it binds the community together. They give you a set of beliefs. So when there is no education and there's ignorance, there are stories told. And so the best way to explain how did we come here, where do we come from, and you want power. You know, you want to influence the people who say, well, you know, God created the world in seven days. For six days, he worked. The seven days said that we're going to relax. So that's the sort of mentality. So, But does that deny God? No. God is forever, for all time. Even from, you know, whatever. Because we can't, we can't know, really. And truly, we can only believe. We cannot really know. But one thing I know, that we are indestructible. Because even when you are gone and you become ash, that piece of ash, that little ash of our body remains in the world. That's the eternal life. Whether then there is a spiritual thing, that's, we'll, we'll find out when we get there. But, you know, these are the things, the doubting, etc. that's where it comes from. So that's Egypt, basically. Uh, that's what I have, and I finished a little bit early today. I'm glad because I can give a bit more time to the Aboriginal history, which, uh, you know, uh, I've got five songs tonight, so I need to, I need to go to, to them first. So up to now, uh, we've done, you know, uh, Seven chapters of a particular textbook and other textbooks that I that I have in front of me, uh, and including some Italian books in other languages. But basically, where I see a good explanation, I use it, and uh, I also, of course, put my own stamp on it if I can. Uh, sometimes, you know, what has been written, there's nothing else to say. But sometimes you need a bit of reflection when you're reading history or anything else, even a, a fiction, a novel. You need to think about it, and you, you, you participate when you uh, when you actually, you know, do a bit of thinking about it, reflecting on what, how, what is being presented to you, in writing or in a film. So here we go. We're going to go to. Now we're going to leave Egypt and the pharaohs. I'll come back to them some other time, but for now. For now, we're going to go into Aboriginal history and starting a little bit earlier today, and I'm very happy to uh, to go to Aboriginal history, Indigenous history, because uh, in the 80s, I taught uh, from a book called, um, uh, called Before the Invasion. So in other words, the idea of invasion, it didn't come in the last few years. It's been around for quite a while uh, because... Let's face it, if you have a continent where people live, 
Neolithic people live. Paleolithic people. But they are people. They've got their own ways. Uh, Australia had about 150 groups, even more, uh, in small groups, 10, 15, uh, 50 people, and they had their own piece of land. And if they had to go to another piece of land, they had to ask permission. So this is what the, this book is about. You know, uh, let's have a look. Let us look at those aspects of life before the invasion that were, we were much the same everywhere. Later, we will go into detail about some areas of the north and the dry inland, the areas we know most about. In these places, the people still remember the arrival of the first Europeans. In no parts of Australia before 1788 were any crops grown, no agriculture. The Aborigines did not dig and plant and harvest. They're not Neolithic, they're Paleolithic. Though they did take care that food plants would continue to grow by their practice of religious rites and by conservation. So I can learn a lot by conservation from our uh, Indigenous people. Instead, the Aboriginal women went out each day to search for edible roots, fruits and seeds. Some of these could be eaten raw. Some of them had to be treated and cooked on fire. So the Aborigines had fire. Well, let's face it. You know, uh, when, you know, got lightning strikes, a fire starts. So Paleolithic men knew about fire, not because they could start it themselves, but because it came from above, from lightning. Women also collected small animals and lizards. They were living by the sea or river, or a river, if they were living by the sea or river, they looked for shellfish. Meanwhile, the men hunted larger animals and fish and water mammals if they lived by the Sierra River. But in most parts of Australia, women brought in the bulk of the food and were the most reliable food providers. Well, again, you know, uh, it depends here. You know, you're making a statement. This is the beginning of, uh, you know, <laughs> the feminist movement here post-1970s. With the feminist movement started a long time ago. So writers have tried to equalise, if you like, the sexes. And to write, it should be done. But you can pick it up from, from the history books as well when the attitudes change, even, you know, relating to race, religion, etc. Uh, you've got to explain it somehow, so you do it the way you know. But in most part, women brought in bulk of the food. Quite often the men came back empty-handed from the hunt. And if you think of Australia, and the kangaroos are pretty fast, and the wombats, etc., men went there to catch one of them. Pretty, you know, it's pretty hard. There were no household animals or birds to give milk and eggs. Of course, they ate birds' eggs they found in the bush, eggs of the emu, mallee hen and magpie goose, for example. And coastal dwellers looked for turtle and seabird eggs on the beaches and offshore islands. I haven't seen a lot of these myself. Uh, so, you know, that's still there. I mean, if somebody wants to really find out, you, well, you go by the... Uh, by the sea and got to get some turtle eggs. Hello, Robbie and Mar Robbie John. Good to, to see you there as well. Good that someone comes up. Leave a comment. Sometimes people took dingo puppies. Now, the dingo is the only domesticated Aboriginal animal, but they didn't really succeed like with dogs in Europe. The dingo remained a little bit wild. Sometimes people, but I saw something the other night where the lady uh, has got a dingo farm. Fantastic. Uh, sometimes people took dingo puppies from the wild and brought them up in the camp as pets. So the dingo can be a pet, but, but the dingo was never quite like a tame dog because it did not breed in the camps. They captured it. Hello, Rob. Welcome. And it could not be properly trained to be useful in hunting, though it might warn of coming danger. In Tasmania, there were no dingoes at all. 
according to this book. I assume that's correct. Again, you can ask those questions. This life of gathering and hunting meant that the camps, the camps had to be shifted quite often to allow the plants and animals to increase in numbers again. As soon as the women had collected most of the plant food near the camp and the men had killed or frightened away most of the possums, kangaroos and wallabies, the group moved on. So really it's a Paleolithic man near the Neolithic stage. It can't have groups that stay in one place without some sort of heart. You can't do, you know. So in other words, not it, they're not pure nomads. They're not pure nomads. They're in between Paleolithic, the old, you know, uh, closer to us, uh, to the Neolithic age. But the new move would be to a place which the people knew well. So they didn't just go anywhere. You know, uh, the older people knew where they went when they were young, so they went back there. They regularly went back to old campsites after enough time had gone by for plants and animals to become plentiful again. Some camping places were used for thousands of years. So there you are. When, we, when the British came and said, Terra Nullius, no, no one here. <laughs> Put a flag, boom. 26th of January. And I think it's a good thing that we we keep on reminding ourselves on the 26th of January that this happened. It's not good for the indigenous people, actually, if they say we don't want it on that day. The invasion, the invasion was cruel. But the cruelty that was practised here was far less than the cruelty shown in other parts of the world, I can assure you. They were quite good here, really, if you think about it, because that was the age of the Enlightenment in Europe. So they weren't real, real rough people. I mean, they were pretty rough, but there was a rule of law too, and they had, they came from a higher civilization. They knew that they knew what they wanted, and they could do it through laws and regulations. I mean, it, you know, rich people arrive anywhere; they start building constructing castles, pyramids, you name it. They, they, and the same thing I've seen, uh, I've seen some films from India, let's say, there are, you know, and the, the Aztecs in, in South America. There, there are big places where stone was used to build very big buildings. Okay, some camping places were used for thousands of years. They did not wander just anywhere. Because each group of 25 to 50 persons had a territory. They had their own land <laughs> in which they had the right to hunt and gather. They. If they wished to hunt or gather in a nearby territory, then they had to ask the neighbours for permission. Now, how did these people here? The, the three authors here uh, have got Aboriginal they are indigenous, you know, some of them come from indigenous uh, families. So we have to take certain things for granted. And you can always ask questions. If they didn't, they were trespassers, it could be ordered off. Go away. This is ours. But there was a great deal of coming and going between neighbouring groups. When the territory of one group had been hard hit by drought or flood, then their neighbours would give them food and shelter until the emergency was over. That's what we do today when there's a fire. We help each other. Australia, that's been going on for centuries, centuries and centuries. And one group would invite others to visit when there was an abundance of a favourite current of plant or animal food. When there's plenty, come on boys, let's... Uh, and that's probably where... But I read somewhere that Australia's total population had never reached more than a million in the whole continent. How did they do it? I don't know if it was a natural process, culture, whatever, but... You know, I'd like to see some films about this, real research, where, because in other parts of the world, 
they kept on, you know, the numbers kept on growing. In Australia, uh, they were kept under control. Maybe, you know, old people married young ones, the, the other ones weren't allowed. That's what I thought. But you'd have, you'd have to, you know, you'd have to check that. Bogong moths were a favourite food of the Aborigines of the southern eastern corner of Australia. This in Canberra area. Millions of these moths appear every spring in the mountains, particularly around Mount Bogong in Victoria. They're called Bogong moths. People came from all directions climbing the mountains from the lowlands and high plains. Have you ever had a Bogong moth on your barbecue? I haven't. They lit smoky fires under cracks in the rocks and the moths fell down in thousands. Then the people threw the moths onto hot ashes so that the wings fell off and then the remaining tasty morsels were eaten. It was a time of great feasting and rejoicing. There you are. This was before the invasion. <laughs> One flag. But unless people kept on coming from Europe like they did in North America, what chance had the, the, <laughs> the indigenous people have against people with muskets and laws and this and that? And you know, use of cru of uh, some cruelty, you know, with uh, uh, killings, etc. In Tasmania, they basically most of the indigenous people of us of Tasmania were gone by the 1860s, 70s. There's a play called Truganini, was supposed to be the last full-blooded Tasmanian. So anyone in Tasmania that comes from indigenous families there is a mix. Further north in southern Queensland, the banya pines and delicious nuts, and there was a plentiful crop of these about every three years. Then the Aborigines from hundreds of kilometres around came to eat them and take them home, of course. The owners of the pine forest let the strangers come into their territory to eat the nuts. It <laughs> can only have so many nuts. There were so many ripe at one time that the owners themselves could not possibly eat them all. Now, it's eight or two. I'm going to stop there. I think I've done enough. And I'll continue next time because there's a lot more to come. Because what I wanted to do was also remember our... Uh, the well, in the 1880s, 1890s, uh, there was a resurgence of the colonials. People were born here who came with the convicts or the guards and uh, they started to appreciate, uh, you know, what was, uh, what, it meant to live in Australia. So that's our history too. You can't deny that. You can't deny the history of the Italians in America, even though they don't like Christopher Columbus anymore. At the end of the day, uh, these are invasions. You know, it's like uh, we now have planes invading each other every day. We built, you know, that's, that's what tourism is. It's an invasion. We welcome them. And we welcome migration too, because without migration, sometimes some of the work cannot be done. So this thing about invasion and, you know, not uh, celebrating Australia Day. But I have been celebrating Australia Day Celebration Week for 20 years. I've done programs for 20 years. I've been saying you cannot just uh, have the 26th. You can have a whole week or even two weeks celebrating Australia and the various histories within Australia. So you can focus on whatever you want. Good idea. But did my Prime Minister know? <laughs> it's like in English, in Australia, we say, pissing in the wind. <laughs> oh, well, I like that expression. All right. This one here is Benjo Patterson. His name is Andrew Barton Patterson. He was 
Sydney solicitor, at the age of 25, he wrote Clancy of the Overflow, which I'm going to read to you. I think I worked out he, he was born in 1864, yes, and died in uh, 1941. So 64, 36 plus uh, about 77 years old. Uh, well, under 1,000 months. But anyway, Clancy of the Overflow is a beautiful, beautiful, this book here, A.B. Patterson, Banjo Patterson. He was loved, you know, the name Banjo Patterson. Great, isn't it? I had written him a letter which I had, for want of better knowledge, sent to where I met him down the Lachlan years ago. He was shearing when I, when I knew him, so I sent the letter to him. Just on spec, addressed as follows, Clancy of the Overflow. And an answer came direct, directed in a writing unexpected, and I think the same was written with a thumbnail dipper in tar. It was his shearing mate who wrote it, and verbatim, I will quote it, Clancy gone to Queensland, droving, and we don't know where he are. In my wild erratic fancy, visions come to me of Clancy gone a droving down the Cooper where the western drovers go. As the stock are slowly stringing, Clancy rides behind them, singing. For the drover's life has pleasures that the townsfolk never know. And the bush hath friends to meet him, and their kindly voices greet him. In the murmur of the breezes and the river on its bars, and he sees the vision splendid on the sunlit plains extended. And at night the wondrous glory of the everlasting stars. I am sitting in my dingy little office, where a stingy ray of sunlight struggles feebly down between the houses tall. And the fetid air and gritty of the dusty, dirty city through the open window floating spreads its foulness over all. Welcome, Stephen. And in places of lowing cattle, I can hear the finest rattle of the tramways and the buses making hurry down the street and the language uninviting of the gutter children fighting comes fitfully and faintly through the ceaseless tramp of feet. And the hurrying people daunt me and their pallid faces haunt me as they shoulder one another in their rush and nervous haste with their eager eyes and greedy and their stunted forms and weedy. For townsfolk have no time to grow. They have no time to waste. And I somehow rather fancy that I like to change with Clancy like to take a turn at driving where the seasons comes and go, while he faced the round eternal of the cash book and the journal, but I doubt it suit the office Clancy of the Overflow. Rob Rowe, Clancy reminds me of you. I know, this been your spirit. You got it there, mate. <laughs> Very good. Now, uh, Stephen is here. I've dedicated five songs today to uh, to Renato Carosone. Renato Carosone, a very famous, uh, very famous uh, singer, well, musicians above all. And uh, he had uh, quite a stint of ten years in Africa, in Eritrea during World War Two. He was born in 1920, and I think died in 2001. Uh, he was just over eight, 80 when he died. And he's left a huge legacy. Uh, but he only had a few years. In, in 1960, at the height of his career, he dropped. He didn't go on. What a pity. But I've got five songs here today. And uh, I have sung this with music with Dora and Rena yesterday. But today I thought, no, I'm going to show you the difference between lyrics without music and lyrics with music. I will play the same the same songs on on the Sunday program when I do Canto Twelve. So the last quarter of an hour. All right. So here I go. The first one is this one here. Let me see. I have to find it. 
I have to find it and I have to remember to do certain things. Okay, here we go. It's called. I sang my uh, Femina with Dora Rina yesterday and we were talking about, um, you know, the restrictions that music play on, on the lyrics. Now, I thought, yep, I'm going to do this again on my own, Mara Femina, but this time here I'll give it the expression that is necessary and at some times you cannot capture the expression uh, with the music, with the accompanying music, because music is mathematical, whereas um, the lyrics themselves are more poetical, so therefore uh, they need a bit of theatre as well. So let me have a look at it, okay? I'll try. Mala femmina. Se avesse fatta nata, quel che ha fatta me, stom, t'avesse acciso. Tu vuoi sapere perché? Perché in coppa sta terra, femmine come a te, non c'hanno sta per nonno, onesto come a me. Femmine, tu si una mala femmine, chi stocchi e fatti chiangere, lacrime e infamità. Femmine, si tu peggio una vipera, non tu si l'anima, non posso più campare. Femmine, si doce come zucchero, per sta faccia d'angelo, te serve per ingannare, femmina, tu sia più bella femmina, te voglio bene e t'odio, non te posso scordare, te voglio ancora bene, ma tu non sai perché, perché l'unico amore si stata tu per me, e te, non capisci, tutto è distrutto a me, ma Dio non ti perdona quello che ha fatto a me. Well, I leave it up to you to decide which version one should do. Maybe we'll do both and discuss it even further. Now, with that song there, I'm going to use this in uh, Neapolitan local language dialect. And on Tuesday, when I do my Italian class, I'm actually going to use uh, the dialect and sort of compare it to the Italian. So the song provides me with many aspects of the one thing. And it's important that, um, you know, th that it is so. Now, the next one is... The next one is... This one here. I thought there was another one there. Or I, I, it could be this one. Well done. Let's see. This is another song by Renato Carosone. It's called Che La La. And I'm going to sing, read it uh, as, uh, you know, without music. I will be doing this with uh, the music, with the... Uh, uh, Dora and Reno on my Sunday program uh, this coming Sunday, uh, but for the moment we're going to concentrate on uh, on the lyrics. Che la la, sta mora metteni van catenato, ma ho detto basta e mi son liberato. Me pare che turchino mare, me pare che lucento sole. E sto cantando pa felicità, che la la, che la la. Mo va dicendo che mo vola sa, se crede che mo faccio o sangue amaro, se crede che mo pazzisco e poi mo sparo, che la la, che la la. Non sa che piacere che mo fa. Non apriglia nata più bella e zitella resterà. Che la la, che la la, che la la. 
Ayer m'ha mandato in un biglietto, pa figlia do portiere di rimpetto. Me scrive che non è felice e che vorrei che mi fa pace, ma io mi sto gustando la libertà. Che la la, che la la. Mi va dicendo che mi vuole assà, se crede che mi faccio o sangue amaro. Se crede che impazzisco e poi mi sparo, che la la, che la la, non sa perché piacere che mi fa, me ne piri di nata più bella e zitella resterà, che la la, che la la, che la la, che la la, che la la. Non sa perché piacere che mi fa, ma ne piglia una tacchio bella e di stella resterà. Che la la, che la la, che la la. E of course there's music, the music in between, you know, the ritornello, eccetera. It adds a lot, the music adds a lot to a song, but again, you know, something is sacrificed and generally it's the expression only the great ones can do it. Okay? Ciao. Well, there you are. That was a, that's a really lovely song with music. It's uh, just wonderful. Now, the next one, the next one, here we go, uh, is another one. By These are all from Renato Carosone. Uh, this week I've dedicated my time to Renato Carosone uh, as we proceed, uh, you know, get more into the lyrics of Italian songs. And uh, I will include also uh, the various local dialects, including the Neapolitan one, the Roman, the Sicilian, etc. as we go along. Now this one here, again, it's without music. Uh, this time, but on Sunday, we'll do it with the music. But this is called Te Piaciuta. Canta Napoli, Napoli matrimoniale, eh eh. Dopo i confetti, su asciute e difetti, caro Giovanni, mo che ce vuoi fa? Se riflettevi e sebbene puntavi, tutti sti guai non stiva a passà, mo che agne te despiere e hai voglia da lucca, che non c'è stato divorzio e tu te la zucca. T'è piaciuta, t'è piaciuta, tiratilla cara cara, T'ha portato sull'altare, sotto il braccio, insieme a te. Ma te vedo affritto e stanco, su coraggio, e giù! Se il melone è uscito bianco, e mo, cucchita a mopiglia. Il matrimonio è come il melone, e può uscire bianco e può uscire anche rosso. Ma che sei matto, non dormi nel letto. Din da poltrona tu dormi perché? Dice che a notte la sposa è più brutta, na cape morte te pare vedere. A dota che ha portato, nemmeno il chiuccio sta, te l'ha pigliata brutta e niente sa da fa. Te è piaciuta, te è piaciuta, tienete la cara cara, te ha portato sull'altare, sotto braccio insieme a te. Molto vedo a fritto e stanco, su coraggio, uè, giù, se il mestolone è uscito bianco, e mo' cucchitavo pigliare. T'è piaciuta, t'è piaciuta, tienete la cara cara, t'ha portato sull'altare, sotto braccio insieme a te. Molto vedo a fritto e stanco, su coraggio, uè, giù, se il mestolone è uscito bianco, e mo' cucchitavo pigliare, e mo' cucchitavo pigliare. That is really a beautiful song, honestly. I love it. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's a classic. <laughs> but it, of other time, you know, the sposa che ha portato, you know, la daughter, the women used to bring uh, something to the marriage. <laughs> but this one here can't do very, very much. This song here is very popular and it's always played. It's very lively music. Renato Garasoni is really a great uh, artist uh, and... Uh, Marvelous musician and everything else. This one is called the O Sarracino. O Sarracino, 
o Sarracino, bello guaglione, o Sarracino, o Sarracino, tutte femmine fanno ammurà. E le capille ricce ricce, gli occhi e briganti sono in faccia, ogni figliola s'appiccia, si lo vede passà, una sigaretta a mocca, la mano di ta tasca, la mano di ta sacca, e se ne va a smargiasse per tutta la città, o Sarracino, o Sarracino, bello guaglione, o Sarracino, o Sarracino, tutte femmine fa sospira, e belle faccia, e belle cure, sape fa amore, e malandrina, e tentatore, se ho guardato la fanno ammurà, e la bionda s'avvelena, e la bruna se ne mora, e veleno calamita, e veleno calamita. <ride> che ste femmine che le fa, o Sarracino, o Sarracino, bello guaglione, e belle facce, e belle cuore, tutte femmine fanno ammurà. O Sarracino, o Sarracino, bello guaglione, o Sarracino, o Sarracino. Tutte femmine fa sospirare, e belle facce, e belle cure, sape fa amore, e malandrina, e tentatore, se ho guardato la fanno ammura. Ma la rossa la tasera, con i vasi e con la scusa, t'ha rubata anima e cuore, Sarracino non si chiù tu, o Sarracino, o Sarracino. Bello guaglione, lo sarracino, lo sarracino. <laughs> But that's, you need music with that one there, for sure. Because it, it really is, uh, a, you know, the music makes it really and truly. But this one here, the one that's coming up, it's actually, I think the lyrics are, are really, really uh, make this song. This one here is called yes, we are La Criminal Bulletin. Christmas 2021. I wanted to do this song uh, for Renato Carasone uh, this afternoon uh, because we did it yesterday as well uh, with Dora and Reno. And uh, well, uh, I thought I would use these five songs to show uh, in my class, Italian class, how a local dialect. It uh, goes well together with, uh, with uh, the Italian, Italian language itself. Because one enriches the other. There's no doubt about it. Uh, you know, experiences at the local level have an effect on the language. So, uh, here we are. Lacrima Napolitana. Mia cara madre, sta per trasi Natale. E a sta lontano più me sa amaro. Come vorrei all'umà due tre biancale, come vorrei sentire un zampugnare. E a ninne mie facitelo per esempio, e a tavola mettito a piatto mio, facite qua nella sera da vigilia, come se mi a voi stesse pur io. E non ce ne costa lacrime sta America a noi napolitani. Per noi che ci cagnimmo il in Napoli, come amare sto pane. Mia cara madre, che so, che so i denari. Per chi si chiama la patria, non so niente. Ma tengo qualche dollaro e mi pare che non sono stato mai tanto paziente. Mi sono tutte le notti a casa mia e dei creature miei mi sento la voce. Ma voi, ve sono, come Anna Maria, con le spade in piette, nanta o figlio in croce. E non ce ne costa l'acqua in questa America, a noi napoletani. Per noi che non ci cagniamo il cielo in Napoli, come amare, stupano. Ma avete scritto 
che assunto la lella chiama chi l'ha allassa, allassata e sta lontano ancora che va già lì se è figlia donna la mamma facita tornare che è la signora io no non torno me ne resto fuori e resto a faticare per tutto quanto chi caggia per sua patria casa onore chi soccorre chi si so carne macella So emigrante, e in cielo costa lacrime sta America, hanno i napoletani, per noi che non ci cagniamo cielo Napoli, come amaro, stupano. It's a beautiful, beautiful words, well expressed, uh, a real story here, but when you sing it, uh, you can actually put, uh, quite a few singers uh, do a very good job with this one, they put a lot of a lot of emotion in it, which is good. But again, without the music, the poetry comes out a lot better. Okay, that's it for today. Well, it's not quite it because I'm still here. <laughs> and uh, I, I see I've got five minutes, which is good, because I can now say, I've, you know, for tonight, uh, I can now say, concentrate on a few things that uh, I've been doing, and uh, I'm telling you, on a Sunday, uh, on a Sunday, uh, every Sunday, in fact, uh, from 3.30 till 5, uh, I am at Federazione Lugana in Brunswick, where uh, I'm trying to attract uh, people of uh, the same, uh, with the same interests in music, in poetry, in literature, in history, uh, and uh, create a, a sort of, a, you know, a, a place where we can we can all uh, see each other, maybe support each other with this, um, you know, online work as well, because um, by doing this, I think uh, it can get a, a bigger audience, a better audience, and uh, there can be some, not just entertainment, but also uh, an educational, you know, it becomes culturally wealthy people. And... Uh, also, what happens is that um, the language, the languages that we use will become better, especially if you come to my Italian lessons, which are grammatical in nature. But I said that um, the practice beats grammar, but without grammar, you cannot uh, improve uh, or perfect the language that you're learning. So it doesn't matter that it's Italian. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm showing uh, the uh, I'm showing the, the nine parts of speech and they are part of all languages so once you learn uh, what those elements are then if you want to become a mechanic of the language you learn the parts and you can be able to teach it and it'll be much easier for you to learn the language because it doesn't matter what type of practice you you have if you need other people there, because when you've got a class, you also meet other people, you go for coffees, and especially with adults. You have a glass of wine, you can do... Uh, that's different. But, you know, for things like that, uh, Federazione Lucan, or places like that, you can have groups of people, say, uh, doing sketches and singing, whatever. You, you, can, uh, you, you can do that uh, in those places, because the space is there, it's a public space, it's a social space. I used to have my own theatre and I made, uh, you know, in, on reflection, uh, I wanted to, to, you know, to have a theatre that was successful, but it was and it wasn't. In terms of numbers, no, because, you, you, you know, you do need a big support to get the numbers there, otherwise the numbers are few. And online, even people come online, as some of the people like uh, Stephen who's on right now, Stephen Ross Ferrara, uh, you know, you find it, well, how many people are going to follow you in those events that you go to? Uh, it's an interesting question and only time will tell. But for me, I have no illusions at all because with education, you need a lot of commitment, enthusiasm, and you need to stay there. And I don't do the work, you do. Once I've done my, once I've done my presentations here, that's it. I don't need to do it again because I've done it and it's there. 
the only thing that I can do is use the presentation then to create the activities around it, which I was thinking about tonight. Because as I move along, uh, there, will be, there will be a development in what I do. And if you follow what I say and you do the work, there'll be a development in what you do. So that's where we're at. And uh, can I remind people, I have a warehouse full of books. I'm surrounded by books every day. So when I want, and I've divided them all into themes and topics, uh, all subject areas, including economics, law, science, you name it, chemistry, physics, everything in English. And they are on my website, my insegna.com website. It's got 20 languages, including English. And the English has got... 12 subsections, and Italian as well. But the other languages only have uh, basic learning material that I have. Uh, and I can't order one book at a time. It's, it's not right. Well, it's 8.31. I've talked too much. And on that note, thank you very much to everyone who's come on. I really appreciate you coming on, and a bit of support is good for me. And uh, ciao. Buonanotte a tutti. Have a good night and a good weekend. See you Sunday. Uh, in the meantime, uh, don't forget to come back onto this. This will go on now. I'll finish off and uh, it'll go on my Facebook page. Ciao, arrivederci, Tom. And from Tom Padula TV and insegna.com. Ciao, ciao.